Hello guys, so today we are looking at NRNNG. Uh, I thought it's better to do it in these batches and uh, in the end I will do the one short one for neutrals and then maybe all of them, we'll see. But for now we are looking first at NR. First card, Squire, Human Knight. Order boost the next unit, uh, next unit you play by two. If it's a knight, also infuse it with uh, the end of your turn, boost self by one. So basically you don't play it outside of knight deck. I don't think it's... No, you never play it outside of... Uh, Knight deck because you have uh, better card, the Radovitz Royal Guard or whatever it's called. It's just straight up better because it gives armor and it has formation. So you play it all only in a Knight deck to make it a engine. Uh, the funny thing about this card is that if you click it in round one and then Squire dies, you can... If the next card, next card will be boosted by two. So sometimes you can put it on some... Uh, weird engines even but it's a fringe situation so you still use it on knights only and making one knight an engine is fine uh, i guess it will be good on cards that are not engine but are knights at the moment it's hard to say what it will be because i really feel like there will be more grace cards which means probably they are on knights so i kind of need to see uh, all of the cards it's kind of in general, it's kind of hard to judge uh, all of these NR cards because there is expected to be more uh, changes to knights in patch notes. Uh, but if there is a knight that is not a engine and it's strong enough to be played in, uh, in the meta deck, then Squire might be played. But I don't know. I kind of think he's too bad, but we'll see. Knights around, on the other hand, I think it's playable. I think it's very... Very controversial card because some people first of all love the art and some people hate the art. I actually I, I really like it because it's it feels like it's this art would hang on the wall of Witcher character if you know what I mean. It's like the painting that is on faultest wall and I kind of like it. Uh, and also um, the same thing about the lead, uh, leader, about the ability that some people like it and some people don't like it. Some people say it's OP, some people say it's trash. But for me, the most important thing is it's interesting. So at the end of your turn, boost by one for each adjacent boosted unit and damage cells for each damaged unit. So basically, it's an in interesting two point engine that is conditional because you need to have boosted units on the side, but it can backfire if you have damaged units on the side. Interesting dy dynamic. Uh, but then you, it has Grace 9, give adjacent units shield and infuse them with. Uh, whenever this unit loses shield, boost it by two. So basically, it changes it. Uh, it gives shield and changes this into the um, knight that we already have in game that boosts by two whenever he loses uh, uh, shield. And this basically makes two of them. It kind of nice works with Pogner, but it also is good if you know that in one turn, for example, you play a card and you know that you will trigger uh, Grace with cards on the board or leader ability like uh, shield wall and you can instantly proc it. So what I mean is that, for example, you can play Anna next to it and proc it with her, the grace or with whatever, and then she will get in, gain a shield immediately. So it's kind of like a, you can protect an engine with it, which makes it pretty strong, I think. And I think this card will see play. I know that Grace 9 is not that easy because you need to boost it by 6 and you kind of don't want to use units that big but but I think it's I think it's good. I think it's pretty powerful and just because you can hide uh, defenders uh, defenders you can hide engines behind the shield and you also boost them. So if your opponent will try to remove this you, your opponent will have even harder time to remove the uh, the, the engine that you play next to Knight Errant. So I kind of like it. Then we have a card that I revealed. I hope you enjoyed the reveal. Uh, but speaking about uh, power level this card. So this is interesting because I don't think this card is super powerful. And if, they, if it would be released like this in the vacuum, it wouldn't be played in meta decks. But in scenarios it's pretty strong why because it has free grace on one card 
I don't know if again if there is gonna be more grace cards. I assume so, but I doubt there there will be one card that can trigger grace three times. That's a lot because, as you know, a spoiler from the scenario, there is a very big uh, buff or be, very big uh, profit from having triggering for, from triggering grace, and if there is a like card with grace one like uh, knight's errand it can only trigger grace once and that's it for for the chap for the scenario but maiden's shield can do it three times that's a lot and also it's kind of easy when you make it grace 14 you proc bronwen grace immediately as well which means you can proc two graces so two chapter ones at the same time so you can get two, four, eight, eight points from the chapter one just by boosting Maiden Shield by uh, 214. I, of course, it's not that easy and uh, Grace 14 on one card making it boost by 14 is quite a lot and you really don't want to make your one unit so high. Uh, and also it will boost all of the adjacent units, but then maybe it will boost something Later, it's like it's gonna be like a um, chain reaction of grace and boosting, uh, but that's why I think this card will be played in decks with scenario just because it has free uh, graces. Is it in vacuum? This card is kind of bad because it's slow and because uh, you really don't want to boost one unit so high. But the thing about this that people kind of forget, I think, is that. You don't have to trigger the Grace 14 for Bronwen to be good. You can boost Bronwen on your own with cards like Drummer or Anna or I don't know, was it Knighthood that randomly boost units so you ha can uh, play around immunity? Like you don't have to use this 14. You don't have to make this Maiden Shield 14 because boost by 3 is not that big if you already have it. Uh, boosted to five so i think people forget about it kind of about it uh, but in vacuum i think this card is not that powerful but with this scenario let's go to scenario progress whenever you play a knight summon a bronze knight from your deck to this row this means that you choose a knight that you play which is pretty interesting uh, because uh, it doesn't have random in it but it's summon not not play so if there is a knight that uses a nice deploy this is kind of bad for it so you want a point slam knight i don't recall anything like this currently in game but maybe in the patch notes maybe in the next uh, batch of uh, maybe in the next uh, batch of cards we will have something like knight eight power damage self by one for each opponent unit and then you kind of can play with this so you know it will be like summoned instead of uh, play i don't know maybe something like this will be there we'll see uh, but for now i don't know for now this is not that powerful whenever an allied unit trigger race boosts its uh, adjacent units by two that's very greedy and again we don't we only know two cards with grace so it's kind of crap at the moment and spawn and play mat charge it's a tiny finisher, it's like boost by 4 and vitality, right, at the moment. So it's very slow and it's not that uh, powerful. It feels, at the moment, this scenario feels like uh, scenarios that we have already game that are okay value-wise, but as you can see, none of them are seeing play anymore because uh, of power level. And this kind of... Oh my, okay, CG is seeing play and sometimes else is being play. Okay, maybe I exaggerated the thing. But this this scenario is fair looking at the at this moment. And all other other uh, uh, scenarios for other factions are nuts. And this is fair. So you know what I mean? It's like, at the moment it's like, oh, okay, that's pretty good. But nothing game-breaking, while other scenarios look game-breaking. But again, we need to see more... Uh, grace unit and then maybe this will be nuts now let's go to Nilfgaard and for Nilfgaard we have interesting thing because we have a completely new cards a new archetype 
First, we have Eternal Eclipse Initiate, Human Cultists, Order, Infuse a Bronze and a Unit with. Whenever your opponent plays a Cultist, they will save by one, they will spawn a base copy of self on the opposite side of the spire and infuse it with the Cultist category. That's so complicated, but I think this card can be actually played outside, uh, probably the only card from all of these batches that can be played outside of Cultist uh, archetype, because other cards you just want to play in, ar uh, in, in Cultist uh, deck while this maybe you can play outside it's gonna be slow it's gonna be a meme but maybe there will be a deck that will just play this and then you will damage uh, with like lockdown maybe with uh, impera enforcers or maybe with some other random like turning jaws just to kill it and then you can spawn some powerful engine, bronze engine on your side. It's kind of a meme, but at least it has a tiny chance to see play on uh, in other decks. And it has a tiny chance to be picked from like Imperial uh, Diplomacy or like from Bribery, while others probably not. So that's why I kind of like this card. Then we have Eternal Eclipse Deacon. Infuse a unit in your hand with Cultist category. Order infuse a unit in your, in your deck with the Cultist category. Obviously, this is Cultist support card. You will play it in every single Cultist deck and you will not play it in not Cultist deck. And that's, that's it. That's all I can say about this card. Uh, maybe other is thing that is people are worried that uh, there is not enough Cultist in, in this archetype. But you have already here two, four, and scenario kind of gives you potentially two more. And then you have Master of Ceremonies, and then you have another cultist that is already in game, the Prophet. So you can get like the long round with playing only uni uh, cultists. So I don't think it's this is a problem of this. So I think people are shouldn't be worried. I, at first when I saw, saw, saw it, I was like, oh no, how can I make a cultist deck when I have literally two cultists? But the more I think about it, the, the more I think it's it's possible. So let's go for Master of Ceremonies. At the start of the game, infuse two random gold non-cultist units. That's very important. In your starting deck with cultist category and infuse them with after this card is played or summoned. If you control three or more Cultist damage the uh, lowest power infused enemy unit by three. It's interesting. I never, I didn't f thought about it earlier that it's uh, plate or summoned. I don't know if it's create any. So, for example, you can do it if in Iharakwax. I don't know how this is worth it, but you can do it. Interesting. Uh, let's see. I need to infuse. Uh, with whenever you play cultists. Okay, this is play. So this is kind of, I don't get it, but whatever. Uh, so basically, again, you play it in the cultist deck. You don't play it in uh, non cultist deck. Cultist deck. Uh, but first of all, it cannot target itself because it's non cultist unit. And second, it cannot uh, target profit. And I randomly checked how many golds you need, you usually have in need of guard. And it's around six, so it's like third. If you play also like this, and maybe profit, uh, so then you have kind of like four, five, maybe up to six uh, gold units in your deck. So it's like a thirty-three percent chance that you will hit what you need to hit with uh, cultist category, and the why it matters because sometimes you because of scenario you want to progress it with you have to progress it with gold cultist and this scenario you really want to play in long round three which means that this has to hit gold units if you play it in round one and i assume master of ceremonies you most of the time play well this is at the start of game so it doesn't matter what i'm saying but this you rather have the no, the cards that got infused, you rather play them in round three. So you don't want to tar get target uh, for this to target the unit that you want to play in round one with this infuse. 
most of the time. So, and that's why I, I guess uh, you have this other part of the ability because cards like Eternal Eclipse Decon and maybe Eternal Eclipse Initiate, at least one of them you want to play in round one. So maybe you can get at least this uh, weird power, weird other part of ability working if you have to play the cultist in round one. But then you make uh, your scenario significantly worse, so I don't know. Let's uh, let's see the scenario. Uh, progress whenever you play a gold cultist, that's important. Spawn Eternal Eclipse initial uh, on this row. So this guy uh, at the start. And then infuse, this is the most, uh, let's read chapter two. Spawn and play Eternal Eclipse Decon. So basically you play this guy, and this is the most important. Infuse all your non-disloyal cultists on battlefield in your hand and in your deck with whenever you play a cultist, boost self by one, then increase this value by one if it was a bronze. Okay, so when you play this, all of the stuff in your deck, battlefield and hand can have instantly infused all of your non-disloyal cultists on the battlefield. Boost self by one, then increase this value by one if it is if it was bronze. I think Mercer tried to do a math, and in the perfect world, this scenario can give you value of like 230 or something like this. Like if everything, absolutely everything goes according to your plan, you can get shit ton of points because you just play, you start with the like this guy is already on the board so chapter one when you trigger it he's getting this infuse so then you play a bronze card he's boosted by one but the next boost will be by two you play another bronze cultist or whatever cultist or bronze cultist and he will buff by two the the first one that you uh played it will be boosted by two, and then every other will boost by three. And it's a, such a chain reaction that is absolutely crazy. And I'm kind of worried about it. It is vulnerable to bleed, but now when I think about it, maybe you will play this uh, in round one, and then you just go with Kultis. And it reminds me that there is Sigrid Ike that purifies everything, and maybe this card will be have to be played. I don't know. I'm a little bit worried about it because it's it's scary and if it goes to a long round three it can get crazy amount of points absolutely crazy amount of points so how the deck will be look, will look like i think it will be something like survive round one and try to win it and then pass in round two and then go for a super long round three when you uh, just play all of your cultists and you don't really care what they do you just play cultists and gain benefit from this and that's it uh, and this is kind of scary i don't know maybe i'm looking at something something weirdly uh, but this is worrying me a little bit uh, the problem of this when i think about it more is that karate heatwave doesn't stop it because it just triggers so Karate Heatwave is not good. Oh my god. When I more the more I think about it, the more I'm worried about it. And because this can really snowball, the only way to win with this Nilfgaard deck is to go for a short round free when these engines cannot trigger obviously. And then this Nilfgaard deck will be absolutely trash. So be prepared for heavy bleed round two meta. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.